I Have Been in Hell, or In Search of Prison Knowledge, by Jeannie McPherson. From Movie Weekly, August 19th, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I have been in hell. I have plumbed the utmost depths of human degradation. I have seen women's souls stripped stark naked. I have been face to face with humanity at its worst. And I have met the most perfect kindness and sympathy it has ever been my lot to experience. I have been in jail. I did not visit the jail as a privileged guest. I went as a criminal serving a sentence. I was arrested, charged with simple larceny, tried, convicted, and sentenced to ten days in prison. I served three days and three nights of that sentence, three depressing days and three horrible nights. I wore the prison garb and ate, or tried to eat, the prison fare. And I know from personal experience just what prison hysteria is. I am a scenario writer. Complete knowledge of my subject is a requisite of my work. It was in search of this knowledge that I went to prison. I found it. In the photoplay that I am writing for Cecil B. DeMille's production in the near future, the chief feminine character is sentenced to prison for manslaughter. Manslaughter is the title of the story. The girl goes to prison a selfish egotist. She emerges completely changed. In order that I might understand the influences at work on this character during her prison stay, I, too, went to jail. When I decided to make this experiment, I selected the Detroit House of Correction as the institution that would best serve my purpose. The name is a misnomer. It is not a reform school. Instead, it is a penitentiary, a penitentiary that has the unique distinction of housing Michigan's federal feminine offenders of every type of crime, state prisoners, county prisoners, and the city of Detroit's municipal prisoners, and doing all this in a fashion that compares favorably with the Middle Ages. There were several reasons for this choice. One was the sinister reputation of the institution. The second was that this is the only jail in the country where petty criminals are confined with those serving sentence for manslaughter. Another was that my family numbers among its friends, a man formerly prominent in the administration of the Detroit prison. This individual was the only person whom I took into my confidence. I wished to have his aid in securing my release should the experience become unbearable. With the exception of this man, no one connected with the experiment knew that I was not, in fact, Angel Brown. It was under this name that I operated when I stole a fur neck piece of nominal value from a woman of my family's acquaintance, who was living at the Hotel Statler. She reported her loss to the house detective, and I was arrested before I had left the building. Hailed into court, I gave my name as Angel Brown from San Francisco, and was charged with simple larceny. I pleaded guilty to the charge and was sentenced to a fine of ten dollars or the alternative of ten days in the Detroit House of Correction. On my statement that I did not have the money to pay the fine, I was turned over to a police officer with instructions to commit me to jail. Just at this point, all my plans were threatened by a big, fatherly Irish policeman who was detailed to conduct me to the prison. On our way down to the alley where the patrol wagon was to meet us, he said, this is your first time up, isn't it, little girl? I assured him that it was. Isn't there anyone you know who will put up the money and keep you out of jail? There was no one, I declared. I hate to see you go to that place. You wait right here. And he pushed me through a door into a bare waiting room on the level with the jail alley. I think I know a man who will lend us the money. My heart sank. After all my trouble to get into jail, my plans were about to be frustrated by the kind heart of a well-meaning policeman. My good-natured policeman soon returned with failure written all over his kindly features. His friend was unable to help. There was nothing else to do but load me into the Black Mariah and send me on my way. He had no suspicion that I was thanking Providence for his failure. I arrived at the jail late in the afternoon. My guardian turned me over to the chief matron, who knew me only as a thief, and the iron bars figuratively and literally closed behind me. There followed the formality of booking me. My name and sentence were the outstanding facts noted by the matron's secretary, a trustee serving a long term. After this, I was stripped to the skin and searched for narcotics. They even took down my hair and made a painstaking examination of it. 
When it came to selecting my prison garb, I was allowed to choose between long and short-sleeved underwear. I chose the long, for it was December and cold. With it went the faded gingham coverall, prison made and drab. Despite the coldness of the weather, this garment had short sleeves. I selected my footwear from a great pile of shoes that occupied one corner of the matron's office. My choice fell upon a pair of dirty, misshapen things that fitted approximately, and had been splashed with paint and whitewash at one time in the recent past. From the office I was conducted by the trustee to the cell assigned to me. It was on the second tier of the cell block, which consisted of four tiers of twenty cells each, accommodations for eighty prisoners. And at the time of my incarceration, the jail contained one hundred and forty women prisoners. Beds in the corridors supplied sleeping accommodations for those not assigned to cells. White and black, petty criminals and murderesses sleep, eat, and work side by side. The cell into which I was ushered was without a window and measured approximately six feet in length, six feet in height, and not over five feet in width, with a barred door one and a half feet in width. Most of this room was occupied by my bunk bearing a straw mattress, blankets, and prison-made linen, but no pillow. This, and a broken-down chair, tin washbasin and pitcher, and pail were the sole furnishings. I made my prison debut in the midst of the so-called recreation hour. This is the period in late afternoon when the girls, having finished a day's work in the shops, are permitted to wander about the corridor-like space that surrounds the cell block itself. This space is called the recreation room, although there is no semblance of recreation facilities, and was very cold. Two hard benches and a few straight kitchen chairs and one small table constituted the furnishings, and I saw no evidence of any books or literature. On the particular day that I arrived, the girls were in the chapel of the prison, viewing a motion picture. The picture was a cheap industrial film, showing the making of a newspaper and the Panama Canal, badly made and badly photographed. I think a strapping Negro girl voiced the opinion of the majority when, at the conclusion of the picture, she said, My God, why don't they give us a love story once in a while? I had heard the clever crooks never talked or made intimates, and that the common criminals respected the mental superiority of those who could resist the temptation to gossip about anything and everything. I was relying on this fact to carry me safely through the shoals of cross-examination on the part of my cellmates. It was fortunate that I adopted this attitude. I had hardly returned to my cell before a delegation of curious visitors dropped in to find out all about me and to get the latest news from the outside. Everyone wanted to know, first of all, where I came from every single one of them tremendously anxious to hear the news from their own home town. Since I claimed San Francisco as my home, I disappointed them all, and it did disappoint them. One girl, speaking for herself, spoke for them all when she demanded, Hell, I thought you was from Flint. My refusal to talk won me immediate respect, and when it was nosed around that I had been caught working the Hotel Statler single-handed, I became a near heroine. This Statler detective system is known and feared by all criminals, I learned. My supposed consummate nerve won their respect. But if I kept silent, no one else did. Apparently, everybody talked all the time, calling loudly back and forth from cell to cell. It is part of the hysteria of the place. Speech relieves the tension that they are all under, consciously or unconsciously. Supper interrupted the cross-examination. We filed into the long dining room, and I faced my first prison meal. Long wooden tables and benches were the chief articles of furniture in this room. Someone with a sense of humor had posted a large sign at one end of the room commanding silence, but the babble of voices and the clatter of graniteware dishes continued at fever heat throughout every meal. Supper consisted of a greasy soup that had soured, two pieces of white bread without butter, a mug of some mysterious black liquid erroneously named coffee. I believe that I can eat any kind of food that is fit for human consumption, but there are limits, and this meal and its successors went beyond that limit. Supper over, we arose on signal from the presiding matron and filed back into our cells. As I entered mine, the door banged shut behind me and locked. Thus I began my first night in jail. For a time, the hysterical racket that had gone on steadily since my advent continued. When it subsided a little, I threw myself on the bunk and amused myself by analyzing my emotions of the day. Eventually, I dropped into a fitful sleep. How long I slept, I have no means of knowing. 
but it could not have been more than a few hours. I was awakened by a peculiar crawling sensation that meant but one thing, vermin. There was no more sleep for me that night. Wide-eyed, I sat on the edge of my bunk and prayed for daylight. I have heard and read much of the terrible feeling of being shut in, buried alive and suffocated, that prisoners undergo during their first night in prison, but until the time of my own experience I believe it to be largely imaginative. It is not. It is the most real thing in the world. I felt that the walls of my tiny, windowless cell were slowly closing in on me. I could not breathe. The close air, heavy with a sickening disinfectant, seemed to strangle me. There are no words to picture the suffocating horror that envelops one at this time. Hysteria succeeds reason. I wanted to scream and beat my head against the stone walls of the cell, anything to push them away. Only one tiny portion of my brain remains rational. It was this tiny control center that kept me from going stark staring mad, for the time at least. In spite of this semi-control, by four o'clock in the morning I was on the verge of panic, partly in an effort to relieve the tension, and partly in search of information regarding prison routine. I feigned sickness and shouted for assistance. I succeeded in attracting the attention of a trustee who was detailed to nurse service. She made a sympathetic effort to diagnose my trouble, but she was unable to render any real assistance. At my insistence, she summoned the night matron and I told my troubles to her. She explained that the jail hospital was closed for the night, that the chief matron was the only one who could open my cell door, even for sickness, and that this lady could never be disturbed until she reached her office at nine o'clock in the morning. That meant if I was in danger of death, I could go ahead and die without medical aid before nine a.m. The night matron even refused me a piece of paper to fan myself with. Throughout my feigned illness, the neighboring prisoners kept up a perfect bombardment of encouragement and sympathy. The nurse trustee was infinitely sympathetic, but she was powerless to aid. This excitement served to combat the evil atmosphere of the night, but daylight seemed to be ages away. And it was not until we were released about eight for breakfast that I succeeded in ridding myself of the hysterical feeling. Sometime between eight and eight-thirty, at the discretion of the matron, we were freed from our cells. En route to breakfast, we made our toilettes such as they were. Inasmuch as toothbrushes, toothpaste, combs, and soap were absolutely forbidden, this was an exceedingly sketchy affair. There were women in that prison who had not had a comb in their hair for months. They kept it in place with string, bits of hairpin, or anything else that could be adopted to the purpose. A trough into which all the prison filth is emptied by the prisoners, also en route to breakfast, does not add to one's grooming. From this service, we marched to the meal itself. Like its predecessor, it was inedible, as far as I was concerned at least. The same two pieces of bread, the same nameless black liquid, or the alternative of bluish-white milk, and a watery fluid in which a few grains of some cereal were floating made up the menu. I counted the cereal grains, I think they were rice, and found six in my dish. Breakfast over, we marched to the shops. We were set to work making cane and reed chair seats. In other departments of this same shop, brushes are made, and the prison tailoring shop turns out the prison clothes and linen. This work is done by the long-termers during work hours, although most of them eat and live together with the short-termers. At noon, we were marched back across the courtyard between the prison proper and the shop building for luncheon. White bread to the number of two slices, two slim weenies, sloppy cabbage, and the unbelievably bad coffee made up this repast. The weenies were a luxury. Usually, mealy-looking baked beans formed the main course of lunch. Meat was allowed once about every two days, I learned. The shops claimed our attention throughout the afternoon, although the total amount of work done was negligible. Any petty criminal who works earnestly in the shop is promptly reprimanded by her sisters. It sets a bad example and makes the prison authorities expect more of the other prisoners. Late in the afternoon, we were herded from the shop back to the cell block and the so-called recreation hour, and once again, I was subjected to a severe grilling by my cellmates. Except that it had lost some of its terror, the second night was a repetition of the first. Sleep was impossible. Through the night, I heard the multitudinous sounds of many women confined in a tiny space, quarreling back and forth, or forming discordant screeching quartets in an effort to ward off as long as possible the specter of the long dreary night. 
I was told on good authority that the old-timers long ago had learned to pick the locks of their individual cells, and many of them surreptitiously visited friends in other cells, for purposes better guessed at than said. Two tiny windows on the wall opposite the cell block furnished the ventilation for this entire structure. Imagine 140 women living in a space ventilated by these two windows and overheated by badly placed steam pipes and you will be able to conjure up a picture that resembles the steam room of a Turkish bath, peopled with all the stenches of human existence made nauseating by the persistent odor of disinfectant. During a lull in the noises, I heard one woman, a cell or two away, instructing a neighbor in the art of crocheting. They could not see each other, but one had evidently secured crochet needles and material, and the other was explaining how many stitches it would take per day to finish the collar for her baby back home by Christmas. By dawn, I was more than satiated with my jail experience. It seemed to me that another twenty-four hours of this would be impossible. Confident of my ability to reach my friend, the prison official, I survived the night. After breakfast, I sought a means of reaching this influential gentleman. I learned that he had quarreled with his superiors the previous day, and, forgetting about me, resigned. Furthermore, I would have been unable to reach him even if he had remained in his position. To serve the full ten days without sleep or food was beyond my powers of endurance. I began to plan frantically to achieve my release. I bethought myself of my mother, Mrs. O'Neill, who was living with my uncle. I took counsel with the nurse, who had been so sympathetic during my supposed illness, without, however, telling her that my crime had been faked. She advised me to go to the matron and explain that I knew of a woman who might pay my fine. Perhaps the matron would notify her. I took an additional twenty-four hours to bring this about. The matron was skeptical, but I insisted that this kind lady had frequently befriended me in the past and might be prevailed upon to do so again. Needless to say, my mother had been disturbed by my continued absence. She knew that I was in jail, but she had expected me to return at the end of the first day. By the third day she was nearly frantic. When the matron phoned to say there was a girl in the house of correction, who said she knew Mrs. O'Neill and wanted her to pay the fine, my mother never even waited to find out the name of the criminal. She assured the matron that she would take care of the matter and hastened to the judge. We have often wondered what the matron thought of the pair of us. My release came at the close of the third day, almost seventy-two hours after my entrance. In that time I lost twelve pounds and I was sick with hunger and loss of sleep. As I left, a group of fellow prisoners gathered at the door to wish me good luck. I shall never forget the picture they made. I call them my gray ghosts. Unkempt and drab, they waved me goodbye with a sincere wish that I might stay out and prosper. No one who has not had a similar experience can appreciate the outlook of the criminal serving sentence. To them, the world is reversed. Out of prison, we eulogize people in direct ratio to their lack of criminal ability. The criminal idealizes the master crook. The bigger the crime, the higher the social position of the criminal. That is the code of the underworld, and nowhere is the effect of this code more strikingly emphasized than in prison. One loses his perspective on crime. Even with my slender experience, I found myself adopting their viewpoint. If the atmosphere can do that to me in three days, think what it can do in months or years to the confirmed criminal. Of one thing I am convinced, most of the women serving in the Detroit House of Correction were cases of psychopathic care, or at least expert medical attention. Many of them, I am convinced, could be returned to normal life by proper care and psychological treatment, not physical punishment, but they can never return under the existing conditions. The effect of such an experience on a woman born and bred to a very different place in life is certain to be revolutionary. The girl in manslaughter leads a life of ease and self-gratification up to the time that she goes to prison. Most of the penitentiaries, and especially the women's prisons in New York State, are vastly better than the jail in which I suffered. But this girl must go through that horrible first night in some intermediate city or county jail. That is one moment that is certain to exert a powerful influence upon her, and by comparison with this experience, the actual penitentiary will seem a paradise. I went in search of experience and I found it. I wouldn't go through the same experience again for any amount of money, but I wouldn't sell it for an even greater sum. End of I Have Been in Hell 
or In Search of Prison Knowledge by Jeannie McPherson. Read by Colleen McMahon. Leibniz's Critique of Locke on Human Understanding Excerpt by Gottfried Leibniz sixteen forty six to seventeen sixteen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org it is unnecessary for us to give complete abstract of this notable book after the author himself has relieved us of this task since in the year sixteen eighty eight he prepared such an abstract for mr clare for insertion in his bibliothique universelle tome eight page forty nine and following before he gave it to the press in the year sixteen ninety it appeared first in london in folio and mr clare again published lengthy excerpts in the said bibliothique universelle tome seventeen page three ninety nine soon afterwards a new english edition appeared enlarged with many pieces and in particular with an entire chapter on identity and diversity which he treats in an exceedingly clear and excellent manner in the second edition mentioned locke acknowledges that he erred in the first edition when he assumed in accordance with the common view that what brings the will to any change of action in the course of arbitrary actions is the assurance of a much greater good for when he considered the matter more carefully he found that a present unrest which consists in desire or is constantly accompanied by the same places its limits on the will for the reasons for this view see book two chapter twenty one he will gladly however be informed of a better view some time after a third and in the year sixteen ninety nine a fourth edition appeared in which last edition locke either further explained his previous thoughts by many additions or supported them by wholly new grounds peter coste made his translation on the basis of this edition and when locke sent him his manuscript had worked upon the same for more than two years locke himself considered this translation a good one and presented his thanks accordingly so that consequently it must be the more welcome by a great deal of us to enumerate all the new editions would take too long hence we will content ourselves with the mention of the two most important which make two separate chapters of which the first is book two chapter thirty three and treats of the association of ideas locke says there is almost no one who does not find something in the opinions conclusions and actions of other people which seems to him fantastic and extravagant and is so in fact every one may have eyes keen-sighted enough to mark the least fault of this kind in the case of another if only it may be distinguished from his own and he himself may have sufficient understanding to condemn the same although he also may have in his own opinions and his own conduct the greatest errors of which he might be aware and of which were it not impossible he may yet with difficulty be convinced this arises he continues not merely from self-love although this passion has often a great part therein for one daily sees such people lying sick with the same disease who are otherwise skilful and whole enough to make nothing of their own merits this defect of reason is customarily ascribed to education and to the force of prejudice and this according to the common opinion not without cause but according to locke's statement this explanation reaches not to the root of the disease and does not show completely its origin and peculiarity he himself explains it as follows some of our ideas his own words have among themselves an exact correspondence and connection 
the obligation and highest perfection of our reason consists in the fact that it reveals such ideas and holds them together in the self-same unity and correspondence as that which is grounded in their particular nature there is besides this another bond of ideas which depends upon chance or custom so that the ideas which naturally are wholly unrelated become so exactly united in the minds a spirit of some men so that they can with difficulty be separated from one another they accompany one another constantly and one can no sooner present itself to the understanding intellectui than the others or indeed more of them so united are they appear also nor can they at all be separated from one another this association of ideas which the mind makes in itself either voluntarily or by chance is the sole source of the defect of which we now speak and as this strong union of ideas is not originally caused by nature it is for this reason wholly different in different persons namely according to their different inclinations education and self-interests that there are such associations of ideas which custom begets in the minds of most men no one according to locke's statement can doubt who with much earnestness considers himself and other people and to this cause can perhaps with convenience and reason be ascribed the greater part of those sympathies and antipathies which one finds among men and which work as strongly and produce as regular effects as if they were natural which fact then makes them to be called so although at first view they had no other origin than the chance connection of two ideas which the strength of the first impression or of an excessively great compliance so firmly united that they always thereafter remain together in the mind of the man as though only a single idea locke however in no respect denies that there are wholly natural antipathies which depend upon our original constitution and are born with us he believes however that with proper consideration man would recognize the most of those which have been regarded as natural as in the beginning caused by impressions which were not heeded whether they were suggested sufficiently early or through a ridiculous fancy locke notices incidentally the difference which may be made between natural and acquired antipathies so that those who have children or who must educate them may see how much heed they should take of this principle and with what care this disorderly union of ideas in the mind of the youth should be prevented he thereupon points out by some examples how such a union of ideas which are not of themselves united yet depend one upon another is sufficient to impede our moral and natural action yea more our notions themselves the ideas of goblins or of spirits agrees as little with darkness as with light if however a foolish maid instills and awakens these different ideas in the mind of a child as though they were connected with each other the child during his entire life will perhaps not be able to separate them from each other so that the darkness evermore will seem to him to be accompanied by these horrible ideas if any one has suffered a grievous wrong on account of another he thinks very often of the persons and the deeds and while he thus strongly or for a long time thinks thereupon he at the same time glues these two ideas together so firmly that he makes them almost one as it were and never remembers the person but that the wrong received also enters his head and while he can scarcely distinguish these two things he has just as much aversion for the one as for the other thence it comes locke adds that hatred arises from slight and worthless ideas and quarrels are taken up and continued in the world one of locke's friends was wholly cured of madness by a certain man through a very painful operation for which service he acknowledged himself under great obligation to him throughout his life 
as he was so circumstanced that he required from no one a greater service during his life reason or gratitude might suggest to him what they would yet he could never bear the sight of his surgeon for as the sight of him always brought again to mind the idea of the very great pain which he had been obliged to endure at his hands he could not endure this idea so violent was the impressions it produced in his mind many children hold their books which were the occasion hereto accountable for most of the ill treatment they endured at school and they unite these ideas so well that they regard a book with great disgust and all their life study and books cannot win their love because to them reading which might otherwise have greatly delighted them became a genuine torture an example notable for its singularity is the following which an eminent man who assured him he had himself seen it relates to locke a young man had learned to dance very prettily and perfectly there chanced to stand however in the hall where he first learned an old trunk the idea of which combined so imperceptibly with his turns and steps in the dance that although he could dance incomparably well in this hall he could do this only when the old trunk was there in other places however he could not dance at all unless the old trunk itself or one like it stood in its accustomed place the habitus intellectuals which are contracted through such association of ideas are as locke further informs us just as strong and numerous even though very little heeded supposing the ideas of being and matter were very strongly united either by education or by an excessively great application to these two ideas according as they are combined in the mind what notions and reasonings would they not produce concerning different spirits if a custom accepted from childhood up had united a form or figure with the idea of god into what absurdities would such a thought in the contemplation of deity not plunge us we shall no doubt find locke adds that it is nothing else than similar ill-grounded and unnatural combinations of ideas which break the path for the many conflicting sects in philosophy and religion for it is not to be supposed that each member of these different sects is willingly deceived and against his better knowledge and conscience rejects the truth demonstrated to him by clear evidence it is indeed certain that sometimes interests assist greatly in this sort of thing yet no one could affirm that it could captivate and lead astray whole societies so that they all none excepted should affirm plain and deliberate falsehoods for it must be that some at least do what others pretend to do namely seek truth sincerely therefore there must be something which blinds their understanding and hinders them from recognizing the falsehood of what they consider as pure and refined truth if we now investigate accurately what takes reason prisoner and darkens the understanding of otherwise sincere people we find that it is simply and solely some free ideas which properly speaking really have no bond among themselves but which by education custom and uninterrupted action on their part are so united in the mind that they can no more be separated and distinguished from one another than a single idea thence it comes locke continues that often the crudest things are taken for worthy opinions absurdities for demonstrations and intolerable and absurd results for strong and fluent reasonings end of leibniz's essay on locke's essay of human understanding excerpt by gottfried leibniz 1646 to 1716「Mental Telegraphy, again, by Mark Twain. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I have three or four curious incidents to tell about. They seem to come under the head of what I named mental telegraphy in a paper written seventeen years ago and published long afterwards. The paper entitled Mental Telegraphy, which originally appeared in Harper's Magazine for December 1893, is included in the volume entitled The American Claimant and Other Stories and Sketches. Several years ago I made a campaign on the platform with Mr. George W. Cable, in Montreal we were honored with a reception. It began at two in the afternoon in a long drawing room in the Windsor Hotel. Mr. Cable and I stood at one end of this room, and the ladies and gentlemen entered it at the other end, crossed it at that end, then came up the long left side, shook hands with us, said a word or two, and passed on in the usual way. My sight is of the telescopic sort, and I presently recognized a familiar face among the throng of strangers drifting in at the distant door, and I said to myself, with surprise and high gratification, that is Mrs. R. I had forgotten that she was a Canadian. She had been a great friend of mine in Carson City, Nevada, in the early days. I had not seen her or heard of her for twenty years. I had not been thinking about her. There was nothing to suggest her to me, nothing to bring her to my mind. In fact, to me, she had long ago ceased to exist and had disappeared from my consciousness. But I knew her instantly, and I saw her so clearly that I was able to note some of the particulars of her dress and did note them, and they remained in my mind. I was impatient for her to come. In the midst of the hand-shakings I snatched glimpses of her and noted her progress with the slow-moving file across the end of the room. Then I saw her start up the side, and this gave me a full front view of her face. I saw her last when she was within twenty-five feet of me. For an hour I kept thinking she must still be in the room somewhere and would come at last, but I was disappointed. When I arrived in the lecture hall that evening, someone said, "'Come into the waiting room. There's a friend of yours there who wants to see you. You'll not be introduced. You are to do the recognizing, without help, if you can.' I said to myself, "'If it is Mrs. R., I shan't have any trouble.' There were perhaps ten ladies present, all seated. In the midst of them was Mrs. R., as I had expected. She was dressed exactly as she was when I had seen her in the afternoon. I went forward and shook hands with her and called her by name and said, I knew you the moment you appeared at the reception this afternoon. She looked surprised and said, But I was not at the reception. I have just arrived from Quebec and have not been in town an hour. It was my turn to be surprised now. I said, I can't help it. I give you my word of honor that it is as I say. I saw you at the reception, and you were dressed precisely as you are now. When they told me a moment ago that I should find a friend in this room, your image rose before me, dress and all, just as I had seen you at the reception. Those are the facts. She was not at the reception at all, nor anywhere near it. But I saw her there, nevertheless, and most clearly and unmistakably. To that I could make oath. How is one to explain this? I was not thinking of her at the time, had not thought of her for years. But she had been thinking of me, no doubt. Did her thoughts flit through the leagues of air to me, and bring with it that clear and pleasant vision of herself? I think so. That was and remains my sole experience in the matter of apparitions. I mean apparitions that come when one is ostensibly awake. I could have been asleep for a moment. The apparition could have been the creature of a dream. Still, that is nothing to the point. The feature of interest is the happening of the thing just at that time, instead of at an earlier or later time, which is argument that its origin lay in thought transference. My next incident will be set aside by most persons as being merely a coincidence, I suppose. 
Years ago I used to think sometimes of making a lecturing trip through the Antipodes and the borders of the Orient, but always gave up the idea, partly because of the great length of the journey, and partly because my wife could not well manage to go with me. Towards the end of last January that idea, after an interval of years, came suddenly into my head again, forcefully, too, and without any apparent reason. Whence came it? What suggested it? I will touch upon that presently. I was at that time where I am now, in Paris. I wrote at once to Henry M. Stanley, London, and asked him some questions about his Australian lecture tour, and inquired who had conducted him, and what were the terms. After a day or two, his answer came. It began, The lecture agent for Australia and New Zealand is par excellence Mr. R. S. Smythe of Melbourne. He added his itinerary, terms, sea expenses, and some other matters, and advised me to write Mr. Smythe, which I did, February 3rd. I began my letter by saying in substance that while he did not know me personally, we had a mutual friend in Stanley, and that would answer for an introduction. Then I proposed my trip, and asked if he would give me the same terms which he had given Stanley. I mailed my letter to Mr. Smythe, February 6th, and three days later I got a letter from the selfsame Smythe dated Melbourne, December 17th. I would as soon have expected to get a letter from the late George Washington. The letter began somewhat as mine to him had begun, with a self-introduction. Dear Mr. Clemens, It is so long since Archibald Forbes and I spent that pleasant afternoon in your comfortable house at Hartford that you have probably quite forgotten the occasion. In the course of his letter this occurs. I am willing to give you here he named the terms which he had given Stanley, for an Antipodean tour to last, say, three months. Here was the single essential detail of my letter answered three days after I had mailed my inquiry. I might have saved myself the trouble and the postage, and a few years ago I would have done that very thing, for I would have argued that my sudden and strong impulse to write and ask some questions of a stranger on the underside of the globe meant that the impulse came from that stranger, and that he would answer my questions of his own motion if I would let him alone. Mr. Smythe's letter probably passed under my nose on its way to lose three weeks traveling to America and back, and gave me a whiff of its contents as it went along. Letters often act like that. Instead of the thought coming to you in an instant from Australia, the apparently unsentient letter imparts it to you as it glides invisibly past your elbow in the mailbag. Next incident. In the following month, March, I was in America. I spent a Sunday at Irvington-on-the-Hudson with Mr. John Brisbane Walker of the Cosmopolitan magazine. We came into New York next morning and went to the Century Club for luncheon. He said some praiseful things about the character of the club and the orderly serenity and pleasantness of its quarters, and asked if I had ever tried to acquire membership in it. I said I had not, and that New York clubs were a continuous expense to the country members without being of frequent use or benefit to them. "'And now I've got an idea,' said I. There's the Lotos, the first New York club I was ever a member of, my very earliest love in that line. I have been a member of it for considerably more than twenty years, yet have seldom had a chance to look in and see the boys. They turn gray and grow old while I am not watching, and my dues go on. I am going to Hartford this afternoon for a day or two. But as soon as I get back, I will go to John Elderkin very privately and say, Remember the veteran and confer distinction upon him for the sake of old times. Make me an honorary member and abolish the tax. If you haven't any such thing as honorary membership, all the better. Create it for my honor and glory. That would be a great thing. I will go to John Elderkin as soon as I get back from Hartford. I took the last express that afternoon, 
first telegraphing Mr. F. G. Whitmore to come and see me next day. When he came, he asked, "'Did you get a letter from Mr. John Elderkin, secretary of the Lotos Club, before you left New York?' then it just missed you. If I had known you were coming, I would have kept it. It is beautiful and will make you proud. The board of directors, by unanimous vote, have made you a life member and squelched those dues, and you are to be on hand and receive your distinction on the night of the 30th, which is the 25th anniversary of the founding of the club, and it will not surprise me if they have some great times there. What? put the honorary membership in my head that day in the Century Club, for I had never thought of it before. I don't know what brought the thought to me at that particular time instead of earlier, but I am well satisfied that it originated with the board of directors, and had been on its way to my brain through the air ever since the moment that saw their vote recorded. Another Incident I was in Hartford two or three days as a guest of the Reverend Joseph H. Twitchell. I have held the rank of honorary uncle to his children for a quarter of a century, and I went out with him in the trolley car to visit one of my nieces who is at Miss Porter's famous school in Farmington. The distance is eight or nine miles. On the way, talking, I illustrated something with an anecdote. This is the anecdote. Two years and a half ago I and the family arrived at Milan on our way to Rome and stopped at the Continental. After dinner I went below and took a seat in the stone-paved court where the customary lemon trees stand in the customary tubs, and said to myself, Now this is comfort, comfort and repose, and nobody to disturb it. I do not know anybody in Milan. Then a young gentleman stepped up and shook hands, which damaged my theory. He said in substance, "'You won't remember me, Mr. Clemens, but I remember you very well. I was a cadet at West Point when you and Reverend Joseph H. Twitchell came there some years ago and talked to us on a hundredth night. I am a lieutenant in the regular army now, and my name is H. I am in Europe all alone for a modest little tour. My regiment is in Arizona.' We became friendly and sociable, and in the course of the talk he told me of an adventure which had befallen him, about to this effect. I was at Bellagio, stopping at the big hotel there, and ten days ago I lost my letter of credit. I did not know what in the world to do. I was a stranger. I knew no one in Europe. I hadn't a penny in my pocket. I couldn't even send a telegram to London to get my lost letter replaced. My hotel bill was a week old and the presentation of it imminent, so imminent that it could happen at any moment now. I was so frightened that my wits seemed to leave me. I tramped and tramped back and forth like a crazy person. If anybody approached me, I hurried away, for no matter what a person looked like, I took him for the head waiter with the bill. I was at last in such a desperate state that I was ready to do any wild thing that promised even the shadow of help and so this is the insane thing that I did. I saw a family lunching at a small table on the veranda and recognized their nationality, Americans, father, mother, and several young daughters, young, tastefully dressed, and pretty, the rule with our people. I went straight there in my civilian costume, named my name, said I was a lieutenant in the army, and told my story and asked for help. What do you suppose the gentleman did? But you would not guess in twenty years. He took out a handful of gold coin and told me to help myself freely. That's what he did. The next morning the lieutenant told me his new letter of credit had arrived in the night, so we strolled to Cook's to draw money to pay back the benefactor with. We got it, and then went strolling through the great arcade. Presently he said, Yonder they are. Come and be introduced. I was introduced to the parents and the young ladies. Then we separated, and I never saw him or them any— Here we are at Farmington, said Twitchell, interrupting. We left the trolley car and tramped through the mud a hundred yards or so to the school, talking about the time we and Warner walked out there years ago and the pleasant time we had. 
we had a visit with my niece in the parlor, then started for the trolley again. Outside the house we encountered a double rank of twenty or thirty of Miss Porter's young ladies arriving from a walk, and we stood aside, ostensibly to let them have room to file past, but really to look at them. Presently one of them stepped out of the rank and said, "'You don't know me, Mr. Twitchell, but I know your daughter, and that gives me the privilege of shaking hands with you.' Then she put out her hand to me and said, "'And I wish to shake hands with you, too, Mr. Clemens. You don't remember me, but you were introduced to me in the arcade in Milan two years and a half ago by Lieutenant H.' What had put that story into my head after all that stretch of time? Was it just the proximity of that young girl? Or was it merely an odd accident? End of Mental Telegraphy Again by Mark Twain Read by Thomas Rose Of Truth by Francis Bacon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. What is truth? said Jesting Pilate, and would not stay for an answer. Certainly there be that delight in giddiness, and count it a bondage to fix a belief, affecting free will in thinking as well as in acting. And though the sects of philosophers of that kind be gone, yet there remain certain discoursing wits, which are of the same veins, though there be not so much blood in them, as was in those of the ancients. But it is not only the difficulty and labor which men take in finding out the truth, nor again that when it is found, it imposeth upon men's thoughts, that doth bring lies in favor, but a natural, though corrupt love, of the lie itself. One of the later schools of the Grecians examineth the matter, and it is at a stand, to think what should be in it, that men should love lies, where neither they make for pleasure, as with the poets, nor for advantage, as with the merchants, but for the lie's sake. But I cannot tell this same truth is a naked and open daylight, that doth not show the masks and mummeries and triumphs of the world half so stately and daintily as candlelights. Truth may perhaps come to the price of a pearl that showeth best by day, but it will not rise to the price of a diamond or a carbuncle that showeth best in varied lights. A mixture of a lie doth ever add pleasure. Doth any man doubt that if there were taken out of men's minds vain opinions, flattering hopes, false valuations, imaginations as one would, and the like, but it would leave the minds of a number of men, poor shrunken things, full of melancholy and indisposition, and unpleasing to themselves. One of the fathers, in great severity, called Posi Vinum De Amonum, because it fireth the imagination, and yet it is but with the shadow of a lie. But it is not the lie that passeth through the mind, but the lie that sinketh in, and settled in it, that doth the hurt, such as we spake of before. But howsoever these things are thus in men's depraved judgments and affections, yet truth, which only doth judge itself, teacheth that the inquiry of truth, which is the love-making, or wooing of it, the knowledge of truth, which is the presence of it, and the belief of truth, which is the enjoying of it, is the sovereign good of human nature. The first creature of God in the works of the days was the light of the sense, the last was the light of reason, and his Sabbath work ever since is the illumination of his spirit. First he breathed light upon the face of the matter or chaos, then he breathed light into the face of man and still he breathed and inspired that light into the face of his chosen. The poet, that beautiful the sect, that was otherwise inferior to the rest, sate yet excellently well. It is a pleasure 
stand upon the shore and to see the ships tossed upon the sea a pleasure to stand in the window of a castle and to see a battle and the adventures thereof below but no pleasure is comparable to the standing upon the vantage ground of truth a hail not to be commanded and where the air is always clear and serene and to see the errors and wanderings and mists and tempests in the vale below so always that his prospects be with pity and not with swelling or pride certainly it is heaven upon earth to have a man's mind move in charity rest in providence and turn upon the poles of truth to pass from theological and philosophical truth to a truth of civil business it will be acknowledged even by those that practice it not that clear and round dealing is the honour of man's nature and that mixture of falsehoods is like alloy in coin of gold and silver which may make the metal work the better but an ambassador it for these winding and crooked courses are the goings of a serpent which goeth basely upon the belly and not upon the feet there is no vice that doth so cover a man with shame as to be found false and perfidious and therefore montaigne saith prettily when he inquired the reason why the word of a lie should be such a disgrace and such an odious charge saith he if it be well weighed to say that a man lieth is as much to say as that he is brave towards god and a coward towards men for a lie faces god and shrinks from man surely the wickedness of falsehood and breach of faith cannot possibly be so highly expressed as in that it shall be the last peal to call the judgments of god upon the generations of men it being foretold that when christ cometh he shall not find faith upon the earth End of on truth On the Evolution of Language by J. W. Powell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in August 2018. On the Evolution of Language, as exhibited in the specialization of the grammatic processes, the differentiation of the parts of speech, and the integration of the sentence from a study of indian languages by j w powell possible ideas and thoughts are vast in number a distinct word for every distinct idea and thought would require a vast vocabulary the problem in language is to express many ideas and thoughts with comparatively few words again in the evolution of any language progress is from a condition where few ideas are expressed by a few words to a higher where many ideas are expressed by the use of many words but the number of all possible ideas or thoughts expressed is increased greatly out of proportion with the increase of the number of words and still again in all of those languages which have been most thoroughly studied and by inference in all languages it appears that the few original words used in any language remain as the elements for the greater number finally used in the evolution of a language the introduction of absolutely new material is a comparatively rare phenomenon the old material is combined and modified in many ways to form the new how has the small stock of words found as the basis of a language been thus combined and modified the way in which the old materials have been used gives rise to what will here be denominated the grammatic processes one the process by combination two or more words may be united to form a new one or to perform the office of a new one and four methods or stages of combination may be noted a by juxtaposition where the two words are placed together and yet remain as distinct words 
This method is illustrated in Chinese, where the words in the combination when taken alone seldom give a clue to their meaning when placed together. B. By compounding, where two words are made into one, in which case the original elements of the new word remain in an unmodified condition, as in housetop, rainbow, telltale. C. By agglutination, in which case one or more of the elements entering into combination to form the new word is somewhat changed, the elements are fused together. Yet this modification is not so great as to essentially obscure the primitive words, as in truthful, where we easily recognize the original words truth and full, and holiday, in which holy and day are recognized d by inflection here one or more of the elements entering into the compound has been so changed that it can scarcely be recognized there is a constant tendency to economy in speech by which words are gradually shortened as they are spoken by generation after generation in those words which are combinations of others there are certain elements that wear out more rapidly than others where some particular word is combined with many other different words, the tendency to modify by where this oft-used element is great. This is more especially the case where the combined word is used in certain categories of combinations, as where particular words are used to denote tense in the verb. Thus, did may be used in combination with a verb to denote past time until it is worn down to the sound of d. The same wear occurs where particular words are used to form cases in nouns, and a variety of illustrations might be given. These categories constitute conjugations and declensions, and, for convenience, such combinations may be called paradigmatic. Then the oft-repeated elements of paradigmatic combinations are apt to become excessively worn and modified, so that the primitive words or themes to which they are attached seem to be but slightly changed by the addition. Under these circumstances, combination is called inflection. As a morphologic process, no well-defined plane of demarcation between these four methods of combination can be drawn, as one runs into another, but, in general, Words may be said to be juxtaposed when two words being placed together, the combination performs the function of a new word, while in form the two words remain separate. Words may be said to be compound when two or more words are combined to form one, no change being made in either. Words may be said to be agglutinated when the elementary words are changed, but slightly, i.e., only to the extent that their original forms are not greatly obscured, and words may be said to be inflected when in the combination the oft-repeated element or formative part has been so changed that its origin is obscured. These inflections are used chiefly in the paradigmatic combinations. In the preceding statement it has been assumed that there can be recognized, in these combinations of inflection, a theme or root, as it is sometimes called, and a formative element. The formative element is used with a great many different words to define or qualify them, that is, to indicate mode, tense, number, person, gender, etc., of verbs, nouns, and other parts of speech. When in a language juxtaposition is the chief method of combination, there may also be distinguished two kinds of elements, in some sense corresponding to themes and formative parts. The theme is a word the meaning of which is determined by the formative word placed by it, that is, the theme is a word having many radically different meanings, with which meaning it is to be understood is determined only by the formative word, which thus serves as its label. The ways in which the theme words are thus labelled by the formative word are very curious, but the subject cannot be entered into here. When words are combined by compounding, the formative elements cannot so readily be distinguished from the theme, nor for the purposes under immediate consideration can compounding be well separated from agglutination. When words are combined by agglutination, 
theme and formative part usually appear. The formative parts are affixes, and affixes may be divided into three classes, prefixes, suffixes, and infixes. These affixes are often called incorporated particles. In those Indian languages where combination is chiefly by agglutination, that is, by the use of affixes, that is, incorporated particles, certain parts of the conjunction of the verb, especially those which denote gender, number, and person, are effected by the use of article pronouns. But in those languages where article pronouns are not found, the verbs are inflected to accomplish the same part of their conjugation. Perhaps when we come more fully to study the formative elements in these more highly inflected languages, we may discover in such elements greatly modified, that is, worn out, incorporated pronouns. 2. The process by vocalic mutation. Here, in order to form a new word, one or more of the vowels of the old word are changed, as in man, men, where an e is substituted for a, ran, run, where u is substituted for a, lead, led, where e with its proper sound is substituted for ea with its proper sound. This method is used to a very limited extent in English. When the history of the words in which it occurs is studied, it is discovered to be but an instance of the wearing out of the different elements of combined words, but in the Hebrew this method prevails to a very large extent, and scholars have not yet been able to discover its origin in combination as they have in English. It may or may not have been an original grammatic process, but because of its importance in certain languages, it has been found necessary to deal with it as a distinct and original process. 3. The process by intonation. In English, new words are not formed by this method, yet words are intoned for certain purposes, chiefly rhetorical. We use the rising intonation, or inflection as it is usually called, to indicate that a question is asked, and various effects are given to speech by the various intonations of rhetoric. But this process is used in other languages to form new words with which to express new ideas. In Chinese, eight distinct intonations are found, by the use of which one word may be made to express eight different ideas, or perhaps it is better to say that eight words may be made of one. 4. The process by placement. The place or position of a word may affect its significant use. Thus, in English we say, John struck James. By the position of those words to each other we know that John is the actor and that James receives the action. By the grammatic processes language is organized. Organization postulates the differentiation of organs and their combination into integers. The integers of language are sentences, and their organs are the parts of speech. Linguistic organization, then, consists in the differentiation of the parts of speech and the integration of the sentence. For example, let us take the words John, Father, and Love. John is the name of an individual, Love is the name of a mental action, and Father is the name of a person. We put them together. John loves father, and they express a thought. John becomes a noun, and is the subject of the sentence. Love becomes a verb, and is the predicant. Father, a noun, and is the object, and we now have an organized sentence. A sentence requires parts of speech, and parts of speech are such because they are used as the organic elements of a sentence. The criteria of rank in languages are, first, grade of organization, that is, the degree to which the grammatic processes and methods are specialized, and the parts of speech differentiated. Second, sematologic content, that is, the body of thought which the language is competent to convey. The grammatic processes may be used for three purposes. First, for derivation, where a new word to express a new idea is made by combining two or more old words, 
or by changing the vowel of one word, or by changing the intonation of one word. Second, for modification. A word may be qualified or defined by the processes of combination, vocalic mutation, or intonation. It should here be noted that the plane between derivation and qualification is not absolute. Third, for relation. When words as signs of ideas are used together to express thought, the relation of the words must be expressed by some means. In English, the relation of words is expressed both by placement and combination, that is, inflection for agreement. It should here be noted that paradigmatic inflections are used for two distinct purposes, qualification and relation. A word is qualified by inflection when the idea expressed by the inflection pertains to the idea expressed by the word inflected. Thus, a noun is qualified by inflection when its number and gender are expressed. A word is related by inflection when the office of the word in the sentence is pointed out thereby. Thus, nouns are related by case inflections. Verbs are related by inflections for gender, number, and person. All inflection for agreement is inflection for relation. In English, three of the grammatic processes are highly specialized. Combination is used chiefly for derivation but to some slight extent for qualification and relation in the paradigmatic categories. But its use in this manner, as compared with many other languages, has almost disappeared. Vocalic mutation is used to a very limited extent and only by accident, and can scarcely be said to belong to the English language. Intonation is used as a grammatic process only to a limited extent, simply to exist in forming the interrogative and imperative modes. Its use here is almost rhetorical. In all other cases, it is purely rhetorical. Placement is largely used in the language and is highly specialized, performing the office of exhibiting the relations of words to each other in the sentence, that is, it is used chiefly for syntactic relation. Thus, one of the four processes does not belong to the English language. The others are highly specialized. The purposes for which the processes are used are derivation, modification, and syntactic relation. Derivation is accomplished by combination. Modification is accomplished by the differentiation of adjectives and adverbs, as words, phrases, and clauses. Syntactic relation is accomplished by placement. Syntactic relation must not be confounded with the relation expressed by prepositions. Syntactic relation is the relation of the parts of speech to each other as integral parts of a sentence. Prepositions express relations of thought of another order. They relate words to each other as words. Placement relates words to each other as parts of speech. In the Indian tongues, combination is used for all three purposes, performing the three different functions of derivation, modification, and relation. Placement also is used for relation, and for both lands of relation, syntactic and prepositional. With regard, then, to the processes and purposes for which they are used, we find in the Indian languages a low degree of specialization, Processes are used for diverse purposes, and purposes are accomplished by diverse processes. Differentiation of the parts of speech It is next in order to consider to what degree the parts of speech are differentiated in Indian languages as compared with English. Indian nouns are extremely connotive, that is, the name does more than simply denote the thing to which it belongs, in denoting the object, it also assigns to it some quality or characteristic. Every object has many qualities and characteristics, and by describing but a part of these, the true office of the noun is but imperfectly performed. A strictly denotive name expresses no one quality or character, but embraces all qualities in characters. In Ute, the name for bear is he seizes, or the hugger. 
in this case the verb is used for the noun and in so doing the indian names the bear by predicating one of its characteristics thus noun and verb are undifferentiated in seneca the north is the sun never goes there and this sentence may be used as adjective or noun in such cases noun adjective verb and adverb are found as one vocable or word and the four parts of speech are undifferentiated in the pavon language a schoolhouse is called po kunt in in yi ken the first part of the word po kunt signifies sorcery is practiced and is the name given by the indians to any writing from the fact that when they first learned of writing they supposed it to be a method of practicing sorcery in in yi is the verb signifying to count and the meaning of the word has been extended so as to signify to read can signifies wigwam and is derived from the verb curie to stay thus the name of the schoolhouse literally signifies a staying place where sorcery is counted or where papers are read the pavant in naming a schoolhouse describes the purpose for which it is used these examples illustrate the general characteristics of indian nouns they are excessively connotive a simply denotive name is rarely found in general their name words predicate some attribute of the object named and thus noun adjective and predicant are undifferentiated in many indian languages there is no separate word for eye hand arm or other parts and organs of the body but the word is found with an incorporated or attached pronoun signifying my hand my eye your hand your eye his hand his eye etc as the case may be if the indian in naming these parts refers to his own body he says my if he refers to the body of the person to whom he is speaking he says your etc if an indian should find a detached foot thrown from the amputating table of an army field hospital he would say something like this i have found somebody his foot the linguistic characteristic is widely spread though not universal thus the indian has no command of a fully differentiated noun expressive of eye hand arm or other parts and organs of the body in the pronouns we often have the most difficult part of an indian language pronouns are only to a limited extent independent words among the free pronouns the student must early learn to distinguish between the personal and the demonstrative the demonstrative pronouns are more commonly used the indian is more accustomed to say this person or thing that person or thing than he she or it among the free personal pronouns the student may find an equivalent of the pronoun i another signifying i and you perhaps another signifying i and he and one signifying we more than two including the speaker and those present and another including the speaker and persons absent he will also find personal pronouns in the second and third person perhaps with singular dual and plural forms to a large extent the pronouns are incorporated in the verbs as prefixes infixes or suffixes in such cases we will call them article pronouns these article pronouns point out with great particularity the person number and gender both of subject and object and sometimes of the indirect object when the article pronouns are used the personal pronouns may or may not be used but it is believed that the personal pronouns will always be found article pronouns may not always be found in those languages which are characterized by them they are used alike when the subject and object nouns are expressed and when they are not the student may at first find some difficulty with these article pronouns singular dual and plural forms will be found sometimes distinct incorporated particles will be used for subject and object but often this will not be the case if the subject only is expressed 
one particle may be used if the object only is expressed another particle but if subject and object are expressed an entirely different particle may stand for both but it is in the genders of these article pronouns that the greatest difficulty may be found the student must entirely free his mind of the idea that gender is simply a distinction of sex in indian tongues genders are usually methods of classification primarily to animate and inanimate the animate may be again divided into male and female but this is rarely the case often by these genders all objects are classified by characteristics found in their attitudes or supposed constitution thus we may have the animate and inanimate one or both divided into the standing the sitting and the lying or they may be divided into the watery the mushy the earthy the stony the woody and the fleshy the gender of these article pronouns has rarely been worked out in any language the extent to which these classifications enter into the article pronouns is not well known the subject requires more thorough study these incorporated particles are here called article pronouns in the conjugation of the word they take an important part and have by some writers been called transitions besides pointing out with particularity the person number and gender or the subject and object they perform the same offices that are usually performed by those inflections of the verb that occur to make them agree in gender number and person with the subject in those indian languages where the article pronouns are not found and the personal pronouns only are used the verb is usually inflected to agree with the subject or object or both in the same particulars the article pronouns as they point out person number gender and case of the subject and object are not simple particles but are to a greater or lesser extent compound their component elements may be broken apart and placed in different parts of the verb again the article pronoun in some languages may have its elements combined into a distinct word in such a manner that it will not be incorporated in the verb but will be placed immediately before it for this reason the term article pronoun has been chosen rather than attached pronoun the older term transition was given to them because of their analogy in function to verbal inflections thus the verb of an indian language contains within itself incorporated article pronouns which point out with great particularity the gender number and person of the subject and object in this manner verb pronoun and adjective are combined and to this extent these parts of speech are undifferentiated in some languages the article pronoun constitutes a distinct word but whether free or incorporated it is a complex tissue of adjectives again nouns sometimes contain particles within themselves to predicate possession and to this extent nouns and verbs are undifferentiated the verb is relatively of much greater importance in an indian tongue than in a civilized language to a large extent the pronoun is incorporated in the verb as explained above and thus constitutes a part of its conjugation again adjectives are used as intransitive verbs as in most indian languages there is no verb to be used as a predicant or copula where in english we would say the man is good the indian would say that man good using the adjective as an intransitive verb that is as a predicant if he desired to affirm it in the past tense the intransitive verb good would be inflected or otherwise modified to indicate the tense and so in like manner all adjectives when used to predicate can be modified to indicate mode tense number person etc as other intransitive verbs adverbs are used as intransitive verbs in english we may say he is there the indian would say that person there usually preferring the demonstrative to the personal pronoun the adverb there would therefore be used as a predicant or intransitive verb and might be conjugated to denote different modes 
tenses, numbers, persons, etc. Verbs will often receive adverbial qualifications by the use of incorporated particles, and, still further, verbs may contain within themselves adverbial limitations without our being able to trace such meanings to any definite particles or parts of the verb. Prepositions are intransitive verbs. In English we may say, the hat is on the table. The Indian would say, that hat on table. Or he might change the order and say, that hat table on. But the preposition on would be used as an intransitive verb to predicate and may be conjugated. Prepositions may often be found as particles incorporated in verbs and, still further, Verbs may contain within themselves prepositional meanings without our being able to trace such meanings to any definite particles within the verb. But the verb connotes such ideas that something is needed to complete its meaning, that something being a limiting or qualifying word, phrase or clause. Prepositions may be prefixed, infixed or suffixed to nouns, that is, they may be particles incorporated in nouns. Nouns may be used as intransitive verbs under the circumstances when in English we would use a noun as the complement of a sentence after the verb to be. The verb, therefore, often includes within itself subject, direct object, indirect object, qualifier, and relation idea. Thus it is that the study of an Indian language is, to a large extent, the study of its verbs. Thus, adjectives, adverbs, prepositions, and nouns are used as intransitive verbs, and to such extent, adjectives, adverbs, prepositions, nouns, and verbs are undifferentiated. From the remarks above, it will be seen that Indian verbs often include within themselves meanings which in English are expressed by adverbs and adverbial phrases and clauses. Thus the verb may express within itself direction, manner, instrument and purpose, one or all, as the verb to go may be represented by a word signifying go home, another go away from home, another go to a place other than home, another go from a place other than home, one go from this place with reference to home, one to go up, another to go down, one go around, and perhaps there will be a verb go up hill, another go up a valley, another go up a river, etc. Then we may have to go on foot, to go on horseback, to go in a canoe, still another to go for water, another for wood, etc. Distinct words may be used for all these, or a fewer number used, and these varied by incorporated particles. In like manner, the English verb to break may be represented by several words, each of which will indicate the manner of performing the act or the instrument with which it is done. Distinct words may be used, or a common word varied with incorporated particles. The verb to strike may be represented by several words, signifying severally to strike with the fist, to strike with a club, to strike with the open hand, to strike with a whip, to strike with a switch, to strike with a flat instrument, etc. A common word may be used with incorporated particles or entirely different words used. Mode in an Indian tongue is a rather difficult subject. Modes analogous to those of civilized tongues are found, and many conditions and qualifications appear in the verb which in English and other civilized languages appear as adverbs and adverbial phrases and clauses. No plane of separation can be drawn between such adverbial qualifications and true modes. Thus, there may be a form of the verb which shows that the speaker makes a declaration as certain, that is, an indicative mode, another which shows that the speaker makes a declaration with doubt, that is, a dubitative mode, another that he makes a declaration on hearsay, that is, a quotative mode, Another form will be used in making a command, giving an imperative mode, another in imploration, that is, an implorative mode, another form to denote permission, that is, a permissive mode, 
another in negation, that is, a negative mode. Another form will be used to indicate that the action is simultaneous with some other action, that is, a simulative mode. Another to denote desire or wish that something be done, that is, a desiderative mode. Another that the action ought to be done, that is, an obligative mode. Another that action is repetitive from time to time, that is, a frequentative mode. Another that action is caused, that is, a causative mode, etc. These forms of the verb, which we are compelled to call modes, are of great number. Usually with each of them a particular modal particle or incorporated adverb will be used, but the particular particle which gives the qualified meaning may not always be discovered, and in one language a different word will be introduced, wherein another the same word will be used with an incorporated particle. It is stated above that incorporated particles may be used to indicate direction, manner, instrument, and purpose. In fact, any adverbial qualification whatever may be made by an incorporated particle instead of an adverb as a distinct word. No line of demarcation can be drawn between these adverbial particles and those mentioned above as modal particles. Indeed, it seems best to treat all these forms of the verb arising from incorporated particles as distinct modes. In this sense, then, an Indian language has a multiplicity of modes. It should be further remarked that in many cases these modal or adverbial particles are excessively worn, so that they may appear as additions or changes of simple vowel or consonant sounds. When incorporated particles are thus used, distinct adverbial words, phrases or clauses may also be employed, and the idea expressed twice. In an Indian language it is usually found difficult to elaborate a system of tenses in paradigmatic form. Many tenses or time particles are found incorporated in verbs. Some of these time particles are excessively worn and may appear rather as inflections than as incorporated particles. Usually rather distinct present, past and future tenses are discovered, often a remote or ancient past and less often an immediate future. But great specification of time in relation to the present and in relation to other time is usually found. It was seen above that adverbial particles cannot be separated from modal particles. In like manner, tense particles cannot be separated from adverbial and modal particles. In an Indian language, adverbs are differentiated only to a limited extent. Adverbial qualifications are found in the verb, and thus there are a multiplicity of modes and tenses, and no plane of demarcation can be drawn between mode and tense. From preceding statements it will appear that a verb in an Indian tongue may have incorporated with it a great variety of particles, which can be arranged in three general classes, that is, pronominal, adverbial, and prepositional. The pronominal particles we have called article pronouns. They serve to point out a variety of characteristics in the subject, object, and indirect object of the verb. They thus subserve purposes which in English are subserved by differentiated adjectives as distinct parts of speech. They might, therefore, with some propriety, have been called adjective particles, but these elements perform another function. They serve the purpose which is usually called agreement in language, that is, they make the verb agree with the subject and object, and thus indicate the syntactic relation between subject, object, and verb. In this sense they might with propriety have been called relation particles, and doubtless this function was in mind when some of the older grammarians called them transitions. The adverbial particles perform the functions of voice, mode and tense, together with many other functions that are performed in languages spoken by more highly civilized people by differentiated adverbs, adverbial phrases and clauses. The prepositional particles perform the function of indicating a great variety of subordinate relations, like the prepositions used as distinct parts of speech in English. By the demonstrative function of some of the pronominal particles, they are closely related to adverbial particles, 
and adverbial particles are closely related to prepositional particles, so that it will be sometimes difficult to say of a particular particle whether it be pronomial or adverbial, and of another particular particle whether it be adverbial or prepositional. Thus, the three classes of particles are not separated by absolute planes of demarcation. The use of these particles as parts of the verb, the use of nouns, adjectives, adverbs, and prepositions as intransitive verbs, and the direct use of verbs as nouns, adjectives, and adverbs, make the study of an Indian tongue to a large extent the study of its verbs. To the extent that voice, mode, and tense are accomplished by the use of agglutinated particles or inflections, to that extent adverbs and verbs are undifferentiated. To the extent that adverbs are found as incorporated particles in verbs, the two parts of speech are undifferentiated. To the extent that prepositions are particles incorporated in the verb, prepositions and verbs are undifferentiated. To the extent that prepositions are affixed to nouns, prepositions and nouns are undifferentiated. In all these particulars, it is seen that the Indian tongues belong to a very low type of organization. Various scholars have called attention to this feature by describing Indian languages as being holophrastic, polysynthetic, or synthetic. The term synthetic is perhaps the best, and may be used as synonymous with undifferentiated. Indian tongues, therefore, may be said to be highly synthetic in that their parts of speech are imperfectly differentiated. In these same particulars, the English language is highly organized, as the parts of speech are highly differentiated. Yet the difference is one of degree, not of kind. To the extent in the English language that inflection is used for qualification, as for person, number, and gender of the noun and pronoun, and for mode and tense in the verb, to that extent the parts of speech are undifferentiated. But we have seen that inflection is used for this purpose to a very slight extent. There is yet in the English language one important differentiation which has been but partially accomplished. Verbs as usually considered are undifferentiated parts of speech. They are nouns and adjectives, one or both, and predicants. The predicant simple is a distinct part of speech. The English language has but one, the verb to be, and this is not always a pure predicant, for it sometimes contains within itself an adverbial element when it is conjugated for mode and tense, and a connective element when it is conjugated for agreement. With adjectives and nouns this verb is used as a predicant. In the passive voice also it is thus used and the participles are nouns or adjectives. In what is sometimes called the progressive form of the active voice, nouns and adjectives are differentiated in the participles, and the verb to be is used as a predicant. But in what is usually denominated the active voice of the verb, the English language has undifferentiated parts of speech. An examination of the history of the verb to be in the English language exhibits the fact that it is coming more and more to be used as the predicant, and what is usually called the common form of the active voice is coming more and more to be limited in its use to special significations. The real active voice, indicative mode, present tense, first person, singular number of the verb to eat is am eating. The expression I eat signifies I am accustomed to eat. So, if we consider the common form of the active voice throughout its entire conjugation, we discover that many of its forms are limited to special uses. Throughout the conjugation of the verb, the auxiliaries are predicants, but these auxiliaries, to the extent that they are modified for mode, tense, number and person, contain adverbial and connective elements. In like manner, many of the lexical elements of the English language contain more than one part of speech. To ascend is to go up, to descend is to go down, and to depart is to go from. Thus it is seen that the English language is also synthetic, in that its parts of speech are not completely differentiated. 
the english then differs in this respect from an indian language only in degree in most indian tongues no pure predicant has been differentiated but in some the verb to be or predicant has been slightly developed chiefly to affirm existence in a place it will thus be seen that by the criterion of organization indian tongues are of very low grade it need but to be affirmed that by the criterion of sematologic content indian languages are of a very low grade therefore the frequently expressed opinion that the languages of barbaric peoples have a more highly organized grammatic structure than the languages of civilized peoples has its complete refutation it is worthy of remark that all paradigmatic inflection in a civilized tongue is a relic of its barbaric condition when the parts of speech are fully differentiated and the process of placement fully specialized so that the order of words in sentences has its full significance no useful purpose is subserved by inflection economy in speech is the force by which its development has been accomplished and it divides itself properly into economy of utterance and economy of thought economy of utterance has had to do with the phonetic constitution of words economy of thought has developed the sentence all paradigmatic inflection requires unnecessary thought in the clause if he was here if fully expresses the subjunctive condition and it is quite unnecessary to express it a second time by using another form of the verb to be and so the people who are using the english language are deciding for the subjunctive form is rapidly becoming obsolete with the long list of paradigmatic forms which have disappeared every time the pronoun he she or it is used it is necessary to think of the sex of its antecedent though in its use there is no reason why sex should be expressed say one time in ten thousand if one pronoun non-expressive of gender were used instead of the three with three gender adjectives then in nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine cases the speaker would be relieved of the necessity of an unnecessary thought and in the one case an adjective would fully express it but when these inflections are greatly multiplied as they are in the indian languages like with the greek and latin the speaker is compelled in the choice of a word to express his idea to think of a multiplicity of things which have no connection with that which he wishes to express a ponca indian in saying that a man killed a rabbit would have to say the man he one animate standing in the nominative case purposely killed by shooting an arrow the rabbit he the one animate sitting in the objective case for the form of a verb to kill would have to be selected and the verb changes its form by inflection and incorporated particles to denote person number and gender as animate or inanimate and gender as standing sitting or lying and case and the form of the verb would also express whether the killing was done accidentally or purposely and whether it was by shooting or by some other process and if by shooting whether by bow and arrow or with a gun and the form of the verb would in like manner have to express all of these things relating to the object that is the person number gender and case of the object and from the multiplicity of paradigmatic forms of the verb to kill this particular one would have to be selected perhaps one time in a million it would be the purpose to express all of these particulars and in that case the indian would have the whole expression in one compact word but in the nine hundred and ninety nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine cases all of these particulars would have to be thought of in the selection of the form of the verb when no valuable purpose would be accomplished thereby in the development of the english as well as the french and german linguistic evolution has not been in vain judged by these criteria the english stands alone in the highest rank but as a written language in the way in which its alphabet is used the english has but emerged from a barbaric condition end of on the evolution of language by j w powell
on suicide arthur schopenhauer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. As far as I know, none but the votaries of monotheistic, that is to say, Jewish religion, look upon suicide as a crime, that is all the more striking, in as such as neither in the Old nor in the New Testament is there to be found any prohibitions or positive disapproval of it so that religious teachers are forced to base their condemnation of suicide on philosophical grounds of their own invention these are so very bad that writers of this kind endeavor to make up for the weakness of their argument by the strong terms in which they express their abhorrence of the practice in other words they declaim against it they tell us that suicide is the greatest piece of cowardice that only a madman could be guilty of it and other insipidities of the same kind or else they make the nonsensical remark that suicide is wrong when it is quite obvious that there is nothing in the world to which every male has a more unsaleable title than to his own life and person suicide as i have said is actually accounted a crime and a crime which especially under the vulgar bigotry that prevails in england is followed by an ignominious burial and the seizure of a man's property and for that reason in a case of suicide the jury almost always brings in a verdict of insanity now let the reader's own world feelings decide whether or not suicide or not is a criminal act think of the impression that would be made upon you by the news that someone you know had committed the crime say of murder or theft or been guilty of some act of cruelty or of deception and compare it with your feelings when you hear that he has met a voluntary death well in the one case a lively sense of indignation and extreme resentment will be aroused and you will loudly call for punishment or revenge in the other you will be moved to grief sympathy and mingled with your thoughts will be admiration for his courage rather than the moral disapproval which follows upon a wicked action who has not had acquaintances friends relations who of their own free will have left this world and are these to be thought of with horror as criminals most emphatically no i am rather of the opinion that the clergy should be challenged to explain what right they have to go into the pulpit or take up their pens and hold as a crime an action which many men whom we hold in affection and honor have committed and to refuse an honorable burial to those who relinquish this world voluntarily they have no biblical authority to boast of as justifying their condemnation of suicide nay nor even any philosophical arguments that will halt water and it must be understood that it is arguments we want and that we will not be put off with mere phrases or words of abuse if the criminal law forbids suicide that is not an argument valid in the church and besides the prohibition is ridiculous for what penalty can frighten a man who is not afraid of death itself if the law punishes people for trying to commit suicide it is punishing the want of skill that makes the attempt a failure the ancients moreover were very far from regarding the matter in that light pliny says life is not so desirable a thing as to be protracted at any cost whoever you are you are sure to die even though your life has been full of abomination and crime the chief of all remedies for a troubled mind is the feeling that among the blessing which nature gives to man there is none greater than the opportune death and the best of it is that every one can avail himself of it and elsewhere the same writer declares not even to god are all things possible for he could not compass his own death if he willed to die and yet in the misery of our earthly life this is the best of his gifts to man nay in massilia 
and the Isle of Chios, the man who would give valid reasons for relinquishing his life, was handed the cup of Hamluck by the magistrate, and that, too, in public. And in ancient times, how many heroes and wise men died a voluntary death? Aristotle, it is true, declared suicide to be an offense against the state, although not against a person. But in Stabius, exposition of the peripatetic philosophy bears the following remark. The good man should flee life when his misfortunes become too great, the bad man also, when he is too prosperous. And similarly, so he will marry and beget children, and take part in the affairs of the state, and generally practice virtue and continue to live. And then, again, if need be, and at any time necessity compels him, he will depart to his place of refuge in the tomb. And we find that the Stoics actually praised suicide as a noble and heroic action, as hundreds of passages show, above all in the works of Seneca, who expresses the strongest approval of it. As is well known, the Hindus look upon suicide as a religious act, especially when it takes the form of self-immolation by widows, but also when it consists in casting oneself under the wheels of a chariot of the god at Juggernaut, or being eaten by crocodiles in the Ganesh, or being drowned in the holy tanks in the temples, and so on. The same thing occurs on the stage, the mirror of life. For example, in L'Ophelin de la Chine, a celebrated Chinese play, almost all the noble characters end by suicide, without the slightest hint anywhere, or any impression being produced on the spectator, that they are committing a crime. And in her own theatre it is much the same. For instance, in Mahomet, or Mortimer, and Maria Stuart, Othello, Countess Tarkski, is Hamlet's monologue the meditation of a criminal? He merely declares that if we had any certainty of being annihilated by it, death would be infinitely preferable to the world as it is. But there lies the rub. The reasons advanced against suicide by the clergy of monotheistic, that is to say, Jewish, religions, and by those philosophers who adept themselves thereto, are weak sophisms which can be easily refuted. The most thorough-going refutation of them is given by Hume in his Essay on Suicide. This did not appear until after his death, when it was immediately suppressed, owing to the scandalous bigotry and outrageous ecclesiastical tyranny that prevailed in England, and hence only a very few copies of it were sold, under cover of secrecy, and at a high price. This and the other treatise by that great man have come to us from Basel, and we may be thankful for the reprint. It is a great disgrace to the English nation that a purely philosophical treatise, which, proceeding from one of the first thinkers and writers in England, aimed at refuting the current arguments against suicide by the light of cult reason, should be forced to sneak about in that country, as though it were some rascally production, until at last it found refuge in the continent. At the same time, it shows what good conscience the Church has in such matters. In my chief work, I have explained the only valid reason existing against suicide on the score of mortality. It is this, that suicide thwarts the attainment of the highest moral aim by the fact that, for a real release from this world of misery, it substitutes one that is merely apparent. But from a mistake to a crime is a far cry. And it is as a crime that the clergy of Christendom wish us to regard suicide. The inmost kernel of Christianity is the truth that suffering, the cross, is the real end and object of life. Hence Christianity condemns suicide as thwarting this end, whilst the ancient world, taking a lower point of view, held it in approval, nay, in honor. But if that is to be accounted a valid reason against suicide, it involves the recognition of a staticism. That is to say, it is valid only from a much higher ethical standpoint than has ever been adapted by moral philosophers in Europe. If we abandon that high standpoint, there is no tenable reason left 
on the score of morality or condemning suicide the extraordinary energy and zeal with which the clergy of monotheistic religions attack suicide is not supported either by any passages in the bible or by any considerations of weight so that it looks as though they must have some secret reason for their contention may it not be this that the voluntary surrender of life is a bad compliment for him who said that all things were good this is so it offers another instance of the crass optimism of these religions denouncing suicide to escape being denounced by it will generally be found that as soon as the terrors of life reach the point at which they outweigh the terrors of death a man will put an end to his life but the terrors of death offer considerable resistance they stand like a sentinel at the gate leading out of this world perhaps there is no man alive who would not have already put an end to his life if this end had been of a purely negative character a sudden stoppage of existence there is something positive about it it is the destruction of a body and a man shrinks from that because his body is the manifestation of the will to live however the struggle with that sentinel is as a rule not so hard as it may seem from a long way off mainly in the consequence of the antagonisms between the ills of the body and the ills of the mind if we are in great bodily pain or the pain lasts a long time we will become indifferent to other troubles all we think about is to get well in the same way great mental suffering makes us insensible to bodily pain we despise it nay if it should outweigh the other it distracts our thoughts and we welcome it as a pause in mental suffering it is this feeling that makes suicide easy for the bodily pain that accompanies it loses all significance in the eye of one who is tortured by an excess of mental suffering this is especially evident in the case of those who are driven to suicide by some purely morbid and exaggerated ill-humor no special effort to overcome their feelings is necessary nor do such people require to be worked up in order to take the step but as soon as the keeper into whose charge they are given leaves them for a couple of minutes they quickly bring their life to an end when in some dreadful and ghastly dream we reach the moment of greatest horror it awakes us therefore banishing all the hideous shapes that were born in the night and life is a dream when a moment of greatest horror compels us to break it off the same thing happens suicide may also be regarded as an experiment a question which man puts to nature trying to force her to an answer the question is this what change will death produce in a man's existence and his insight into the nature of things it is a clumsy experiment to make for it involves the destruction of the very consciousness which puts the question and awaits the answer end of on suicide author schopenhauer